to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. We welcome you today to our study of the nature of the New Testament church. What do we know about the New Testament church? Who built it? When was it founded? Whose name does it carry? How is it organized? Those are questions that we're going to be asking and answering from the Word of God today. And friend, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study of this wonderful subject. We want to encourage you, if you haven't got your Bible handy already, that you'll locate your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God as our final authority in these matters. Also, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ, in your area. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about lost souls and who more than anything want men and women to go to heaven. And so visit their study, their assembly. They'd be glad to have you there. And as we think about studying the Word of God, friend, we want to encourage you to check us out on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, you can access all our videos and audios, all our written material. It's a great tool for use in studying, for using and studying uh, God's Word on various subjects. And so check out our website. From there, you can order free media. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on audio or video, written transcript, we provide all of those available to you free of charge. Just go to our media request form. From there, you can uh, fill out a media request form and we'll be glad to have that sent to you in a digital download. Or if you need a hard copy of that on CD or DVD, we'll send that to you free of charge. And so we hope today that as we study the Word of God, each one of us can draw closer to God and His Word on this wonderful subject. And so let's turn our attention now to the nature of of the New Testament church, the church we read about in the Bible. What is it really like? What are its identifying characteristics? How can I know I'm a part of God's church, not a part of some man-made organization? As we begin today, let's begin by asking the question, who founded the New Testament church? That is, who started the church that we read about in the Bible. Well, friend, we can clearly see from the Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ and Him only founded the New Testament church. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3.11. No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, which is already laid. Well, what is it? Which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation and the founder of His church. How do I know Jesus started it and not men? Well, let's hear it from the Word of Jesus, right? Open your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 16. And I want you to look at what Jesus said about founding or starting His church. Matthew 16. In response to Peter saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus then said to Peter, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, watch now, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Who built the Lord's church? Jesus did. He's the one who founded it. He's the one who built it. Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 says, nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friend, not only is He the foundation, not only is He the founder, but there's no other way outside of Jesus and His plan that men can be saved. And so friend, as we ask this question, 
who founded the New Testament church, and we see from the Bible that the answer is Jesus, we then have to follow that up with a second question. Who founded modern denominations today? And friend, as we look to the historical evidence, it's very clear. For example, who founded the Lutheran church? Well, Martin Luther did. Who started the Presbyterian church? History records, John Knox did. Uh, the, the Calvinism, the Calvinistic church, who started that? John Calvin. Who started the Baptist church? John Smith did. Uh, the Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Who started that? Joseph Smith. And the list goes on and on. And friend, here's the point we're trying to drive home. I want to be a part of the church Jesus founded. I don't want to be a part of a church that was started by men, that was founded by men, and that wasn't founded in the first century based on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of the church the Lord added people to in Acts chapter 2. And friend, that's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that we find there. Then let's ask a second question that helps us identify the Lord's church and understand its nature. Not only do we ask who founded the, North, the Lord's church, the church in the Bible, but when does the Bible say the New Testament church would be founded? There are several passages that help us with this. The first is Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, uh, God is promising and prophesying about His eternal kingdom that's going to come. In Daniel 2 verse 44, Daniel says, In the time of these kings, and here's what he's talking about, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Roman Empire. In the time of these four kings, God will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Now, God already has a kingdom. During the Babylonian Empire, that's Israel. During the Medo-Persian, during the Greek Empire, God is still reigning through the Old Testament kingdom of Israel, but something amazing happens in that fourth kingdom. God and His Son promise that eternal kingdom is coming. You see, Mark 9, verse 1, Jesus made this promise. Jesus looked around at His disciples and He said this, And I say to you that there are some of you standing here today who will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God present with power. And so Jesus promised to His immediate disciples, some of them were going to see that eternal kingdom. And we know that happened. For in Colossians 1 verse 13, the Bible says that God had translated Christians out of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Acts 28, verse 30 and 31, the Apostle Paul is already preaching the kingdom as a present reality. And so when did the kingdom start? It started during that Roman era when Jesus promised to build His church, when He died on the cross, and in Acts chapter 2, when for the first time, men and women were added to the Lord's church. Now friend, let's again make application to that. I want to be a part of the church that was started on the day of Pentecost. When did most modern denominations start? A friend, it wasn't in the first century. It wasn't in Acts chapter 2. Most of them were at least 1,500 years later. The Roman Catholic Church started 600 years too late. 606 is the date that it was started, but most were hundreds of years after that, but 600 years. It's still too late for the Lord's church. Think about some of these. The Lutheran church was started in 1517. The Baptist church, when was it started? It was started by John Smith in 1605. Latter-day Saints were 1830. Most of them were at least 150 years ago. Now, friend, what's the point we're making? Are we saying that these people were ungodly and immoral? That's not the idea. But, friend, here's the point we want to drive home. If the Lord's church, the church we read about out in the Bible, that one day is going home to be with God, was started in the first century, why would I want to be a part of the church that came on a church, a denomination that came along 1,500, 1,700, 2,000 years later? I want to go back to the original pattern, and I want to be a part of the church Jesus died for. 
Let's then think about a third identifying characteristic as it relates to the nature of the New Testament church. Not only is the who, when it, who started it, and the when was it started important, but where was the New Testament church supposed to start? Did you know there is a specific place that was prophesied? I want you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 2, and I want you to see what the prophet said. Look at Isaiah chapter 2 about where the Lord's church was going to start. Isaiah chapter 2, look at what is said in verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, all nations shall flow to it, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, we shall walk in His paths. Now watch this. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from where? From Jerusalem. Where did the Bible promise the church would start? Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. The promise was made that the Lord's church would start in Jerusalem. And friend, when we open up to the New Testament, that's exactly what happened. Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up with the eleven. And for the first time in Jerusalem, preaches salvation in Jesus as a reality. And for the very first time, men and women are added to the church. The Lord's church was founded, started in Jerusalem. Someone says, okay, that's all good and well, but why is that important? Friend, don't we want to be a part of the church Jesus died for? Don't we want to be a part of the people God promised would one day go home with them? If I'm a part of a religious group that was started by man during some other time frame, not where God said it would start, am I really a part of the Lord's church? Again, let's make practical application to that. Where did most modern religious groups start at? Well, most were in England or the Americas. For example, the Martin the Lutheran Church started in Germany. Uh, we think about other religious groups. For example, the Anglican Church started in England. Calvinism was started in Switzerland. And, and the list could go on. The Methodist Church was started in England. Latter-day Saints, they were started in uh, America, Palmyra, New York. Uh, Christian Science, Jehovah's Witness, all of those were started in America, not in Jerusalem. Says, okay, well, that's good and I can understand that, but so what? Friend, again, we want to go by what the Bible says. I want to be a part of the church that started in, I want to be a part of the church that Jesus died for, that, 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 that Peter, that Paul, that James and John, that they were all members of, and be a part of the church God founded and not men. And here's what's great about that. If I take the Bible and I read it and I study it and I do what they did in the first century, listen now, I do what they did in the first century to obey the gospel and become a Christian, I'm a member of the exact same church they were a part of then. But we've got to go back to the Bible to do that. Now, here's a fourth identifying characteristic that's so important. And friends, so many people miss this idea. What do we know about the New Testament church? Friend, let's ask ourselves, what name in the New Testament did the church wear? Now, we know names are important, for at some time, God changed people's names. God changed Saul of Tarsus from Saul to Paul. We know names are important because when we get married, we want our wife to carry our name. Names have importance to them. And friend, God specifically identified what His called out people would go by. Romans 16, verse 16, the Bible says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2, To the church of God, which is at Corinth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, The house of the living God, the church of the living God. Uh, Hebrews 12, verses 28 and 29, To the church of the firstborn. Are you seeing a pattern there? Church of Christ, church of God. Church of the living God, the assembly, the called out of the firstborn. What do all of those designations do? Well, friend, listen real carefully. They bring honor to God and to Christ and to them only. Is there anything in a name? 
Oh, you bet there is. How many people would in good uh, conscience name their child Judas Iscariot? How many people would want to name somebody Hitler or Jezebel? Names carry a connotation and an idea. And friend, if the name of the church, if, the, if what the people are called, the called out people are, are identified by, doesn't bring honor to glory and glory to God in Christ, then who is it bringing honor to? When it carries the idea, the name of some man. For example, we say, I'm a member of the Lutheran church. Can I ask you, who gets the glory in that? I'm a member of the Methodist Church. We follow the, the, meth, the, the method of John Wesley. Who does that bring honor and glory to? I'm a part of Calvinism. It brings honor to John Calvin. Or if it's named after some act in the Bible and not God itself. For example, I'm a member of the Baptist Church. We emphasized long ago, the, uh, apart from those who believed in sprinkling, baptism. Well, friend, that's emphasizing an act, not God. What's the point? Jesus said, I will build my church. In the Bible, it's referred to as the church of God, the church of Christ, the assembly of the firstborn, the called out people. All of those are Bible names. And friend, here's why that's real important. Does the Bible say we ought to do things in the way Bible, the Bible wants us to? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says, we're not to go beyond what's written. The Bible says we're not to add to or to take away. From the Word of God, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. We're only to do that which we are authorized in the Scripture. If the modern names for religious groups are not found in the Bible, aren't we going beyond what's written? Wouldn't it just be better to stay within the bounds of the Scripture and go by what God has called us in the New Testament? Then let's notice another identifying characteristic of the Lord's church that we find uh, in the Bible, and that is this. What's the purpose of the church? You know, to a lot of people, the, the church is sometimes just a gathering place or a social place, social club. But that's not what we read about in the New Testament. The church has a divine purpose. Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says that it was the uh, eternal purpose of God for the church to spread the gospel to principalities and powers and those in high places. The church has a divine purpose and it is to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Bible tells us we are to seek and to save those who are lost. Matthew 28, 18, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, we are to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And so as we think about the church, is it accomplishing its divine purpose of spreading the gospel to all those who are outside of Jesus Christ? Now, another characteristic, and this is a big one, how can we identify the Lord's church in a world where there's a lot of religious confusion? Let's ask this question. In the New Testament, how was the church organized? Well, let's open our Bible and see. Would you open to Philippians chapter 1, and I want you to look in verse number 1. Let's see how the New Testament church was organized and see if modern denominationalism fits that idea. Philippians chapter 1 Look at what the Bible says in verse number 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops or overseers and the deacons. Friend, when I think about the New Testament church, there's no big me and little you. There's no clergy laity. There is no hierarchy where somebody else is more important to God. That's foreign to the New Testament. There's no one man leading everything. Call no man father. Matthew 23, verse number 9. What do we see? We're all on level ground at the foot of the cross to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, verse 1. In every individual congregation, Acts chapter 14, verse 23, elders are appointed. Also seen in the Bible as overseers, bishops, or shepherds. There is always a plurality 
of elders, not one man leading everybody. Paul left Titus in Crete to set in order the things that are lacking and to appoint elders in every city. Every city had a congregation, so he's appointing elders in those congregations. Just like in Titus 1.5, where there were elders in every congregation, in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, the Bible teaches that elders are to be shepherds over the flock, and they're not to be lords over anybody. Friend, there is not one person who is the, over the Lord's church today who's the head of the church. How do we know that? Because Jesus is still the head of the church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, and God's Word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse number 89. Elders. You have elders in the Lord's church. They're watching out for people's souls. We have uh, deacons who are servants of God and each have specific qualifications found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then all saints follow under that, but even then we all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. And so is the church that one is a part of organized with elders and deacons and all Christians, no clergy lady, no big me and little you. That's the church we find in the New Testament. Let's ask another question that helps us identify the Lord's church. How many churches did the Lord Jesus Christ intend to build? Or how many did He build? Well, friend, we know from the Bible that Jesus built one church. Open your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to notice with me a couple of passages that help us to see this. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, and I want you to look in verses 22 and 23. Paul said, And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. When we think about the church, God uses the word church and body one and the same. He's the head of the church, which is his body. And so understanding that the church is the body and those are interchangeable, flip over, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4. The Bible says this, There is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so the Bible says the body's the church. The Bible says there's one body. Ephesians 4 verse 4. How many churches are there? There are many members, yet but one body. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 20. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts into which you were called into one body. Colossians 3, verse 15. By one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. There are many members with many talents, yet one body. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. Even Jesus said that, did He not? Of on this rock, I will build my church. And so as we think about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, friend, let's realize it's singular in its nature. God did not intend to build three or five or ten thousand denominational groups, each teaching a different thing, each with a different flavor. No, we can go to the Bible and we can know who started the church, Jesus Christ. We can know when it was started in Acts chapter 2, A.D. 30. We can know where the Bible prom prophesied it would be started, and that is in Jerusalem. We can know how the church is organized, how many there are, and friend, we can know how one becomes a member of the New Testament church. You know, this is what's so refreshing. This is what's so wonderful. To become a member of the New Testament church, I don't have to be voted in. I don't have to be approved by men. I don't have to do anything that man tells me to do. All I've got to do is do what Jesus said. Jesus taught very clearly that to become a Christian, to be a member of His church, one must hear the Word of God. In John chapter 8, verse number 24, Jesus said this, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. And so, once I've heard that message, I've got to do what Jesus said and believe in Him as the Son of God. The Bible teaches that to become a member of the Lord's church, one must repent of sin 
Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn that your sins might be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so I've got to turn from a life of sin and turn to God. The Bible teaches one must also make the good confession. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. So I've got to make that good confession. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, friend, hear it well today. The Bible teaches to get into God's church, one must be immersed in water. How do you get in the church? By one spirit we're all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 27. The Bible teaches we are baptized into Christ. As many as were baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. Galatians 3, verse 27. We're born of water and the Spirit to get into God's kingdom. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. And yes, to be saved, Jesus said you had to be baptized. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did Jesus say you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? Absolutely. And friend, that's what they were told when the Lord's church started in Acts chapter 2. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we realize we've killed our own Savior, the Christ. What do we need to do to get right with God? And Peter said, Let every one of you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and Acts chapter 2 verse 47. And friend, we mention this as an identifying characteristic of the New Testament church for this reason. If a religious group is teaching something different to do to be saved than what you find in the Bible and what you find on the day of Pentecost to become a member of the Lord's church, how could they be the church Jesus started? And so we hope and pray that you'll continue with us in this series of lessons as we're going to think more about the church Jesus died for. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.